Well, good morning, and welcome to the worship of the living God. Our preparation for worship this morning comes to us from Bob Coughlin. Bob Coughlin, his responsibilities, he is the worship leader at a church up in Minneapolis. And so his job, full-time, is to think, okay, how can I help people worship God better? So what you got here is somebody who all week thinks, how can I help people like, like me, like you, worship God? To worship God is to humble everything about ourselves and to exalt everything about him. So that's what you're here to do. That's what I'm here to do. To humble everything about us, and that, that's hard, and to exalt everything about him, which should be easy, but, but because we're sinful, it's very hard. Our call to worship is about somebody who does just that. It's little Samuel. Remember when he, he's a little guy? Hannah takes him to the temple, and uh, the author, she says, Hannah says, now I'll give him to the Lord. In his whole life, he'll be given over to the Lord. And little Samuel will worship the Lord there. That's what you're here to do. That's what I'm here to do. Give ourselves over to God. We're going to be doing so together. We're going to be standing and praising God together, singing, Oh, praise the name. Praise the name. 
let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just declared our desire to, to sing your praise endlessly. And Father, as we behold your beauty, as we see you for who we are, Father, that is what we do indeed want. I pray that each of us this morning, Father, would have a taste of that. We would taste and see that you are good, that you are what we need, even though we run so often everywhere else. Father, we thank and praise you for gathering us together to be with you and be with each other. We ask that we would indeed be blessed to be in the house of the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And this great God... He's the one who welcomes you and greets you with these words. And may grace be yours. May God's mercy be yours. May his peace rest upon you. This comes from the God who is and the God who was and the God who is to come. And all of God's people said, amen. And as God's welcomed us, let's take this opportunity to welcome one another. Continue praising our God together, singing Glorious Day.
Please be seated. We have the opportunity now to see what it is that God's doing in our GEMS ministry. So we look forward to hearing, hearing all about that. Well, we have, we have been having an awesome day, our year in GEMS. We have 26 girls that have been coming. We picked up a few different members throughout um, the year. So the girls have been doing a great job of inviting friends and others there. Um, there's five of us counselors that um, try to wrangle them every <laughs> time that we meet. Um, so GEMS, what does the Lord require of you? And during a typical week, what we'll do is meet together as a large group. We'll go over our model, and then we'll sing some praise and worship songs. And then we go over what our theme. And our theme for this year is Friended. It comes from John 15, verse 15, which is, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Um, so we have first learned about how we are never alone because Jesus is our best friend and he's always with us and the best friend we could have. And now we're learning how to look at Jesus' example and figure out how to be really good friends to one another. So there's five different areas we've been looking at. So far we've learned how to love one another, how to serve one another, and pray for one another. And spoiler alert, upcoming we're going to have how to accept one another and to be kind to one another. So that would be how we wrap up our lessons. Um, we've had lots of other fun things, um, close to home adventures. Um, we had photo scavenger hunts and we've done nativity escape rooms, had our daddy date night Christmas party and we just had a luau with the moms. So we do lots of other things to, to keep the girls entertained as well as the craft that we have during our lesson week. So that's what we're kind of about. Um, we want to thank all of you for your prayers and support. Um, thank you for buying the cards. That's a nice little ongoing fundraiser that helps keep us in craft supplies and in our lessons and things like that. So that is what we have. Thank you. Briefly talking to Abby about all the fun things they're doing. I kind of think I'm the wrong gender and the wrong age to be in GEMS, but uh, it seems like a whole lot of fun and learning a lot of good things. Also, girls, well done with the verse. I mean, I've kind of got the sermon manuscript right in front of me, so I don't memorize, but they, they rattled off that verse just like that. So well done. We're going to be going to God in prayer in a moment. Um, first, almost... I, Almost, I, yeah, the whole time I've been doing ministry, kind of what I've heard is we miss when people used to visit uh, on Sundays, used to go to people's houses and have, have supper after in the evenings. Um, I attempt to uh, kind of recapture that after the, the evening service. What we're going to be doing is we're going to start this, this week and start this month, see how it goes, just have a very light potluck after the evening service. Some of us have thought about, man, we miss seeing each other, especially with uh, the pandemic. And here's an opportunity just to eat meal very light after the evening service. And I want to emphasize very light because with hospitality, we think, okay, what, what am I going to make? Uh, what, are, what is so-and-so going to think? If you bring hot dogs, that, that's, that's, that's fine. If you bring hot dogs you haven't even boiled or grilled, that, that's more than fine. It's more important that you come. And yeah, there's, there'll be food there, so you bring a bag of chips. That's, that's, that's more than cool. The, the goal is just on Sunday evenings to, to eat and round out the, the day of rest and worship. So we'll do the, this evening after the service, and we'll see how that goes. We're going to be going to our, our God in prayer now. We're going to be using Nathan's prayer, um, Ethan's prayer in the Psalms to kind of organize our prayer. We will sing of your great love forever. With our mouths, we will make your faithfulness known through all generations. 
Father, like Ethan in Psalm 89, we delight in your love, and we want to make your reliability known to the next generation, so they'll delight in your love too. We like the fact that you do good to us, your people, and we like the fact that we can trust you no matter the circumstance. We want others, especially, Father, covenant children, those who, Father, you've given to us to, to raise, and Father, children that we, we come to meet, we want them to know your ways, to know that you are a Father that they can trust, that you'll always be there for them, leading and, and guiding as they put their trust in you. And we recognize you're working, Father, through our ways to, to make your faithfulness known. This is your work, and we're coming alongside you and GEMS. Please continue to, to help the counselors, Father. Continue to keep in step with the Spirit. We thank you for the work these women are putting in as they point these girls beyond, them, beyond, them, beyond themselves to you. In this world, Father, that so quickly crafts everything into how we can help ourselves, we're so thankful that we can be helped by you because we, we all certainly need it. We pray for the, the girls who were up here, Father, the girls who weren't able to be here this morning. We ask that they might see you as, as more glorious, Father, at the end of the year than they did at the beginning, that they might have a, a greater desire to, to flee, Father, from sin and the, the damage that it causes by the end of the year than they did at the beginning. We pray that they would recognize Jesus as a, a greater Savior at the end of the year that they did at the beginning. We ask that they're relationships with one another and others would be closer at the end of the year than at the beginning. Father, this would be a great delight to their, their counselors, a great delight, Father, to us as a church, a great delight to them, but most importantly, that would give you great delight. Your servant Ethan noticed your, your great worth and power, saying, Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty. Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And we trust that power, even though we don't often understand. We trust that you who created everything sustain everything, and you sustain us, us each moment for your purposes. We pray for Tony Travis as he waits on your purposes in a particularly difficult moment. Give him peace as he continues to, to see about this, this lung transplant. Keep him free from infection. Help him to, to keep his weight on. Help his lungs to keep up strength. We pray for Marcine as she cares for him. Life is, is so often scary, and we need reminders of your power. And we all, Father, would be a bit more content if we had a bigger understanding of your goodwill toward us and your power. Your purposes, we ask that each of us might grow more and more into that, just as the gems are. Father, we think of Ethan's words, blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness, for you are their glory and their strength. And Father, your Corny Folkert's glory and strength, your Dave DeVries's glory and strength. And as these men, Father, are, are in hospice care, they recognize in different ways that their own glory and strength is, is like a flower of the field. springs up, and Father, life is, is short, and one day it's gone. And that's always true, but hospice care, Father, gets us thinking about that in new ways. We see the brevity of life in a new way, we see the joy of life in a new way, and we see the pain of life in a new way, and show these men that you are their glory, you are their unfailing, unfading strength and beauty in a new way, and Father, show their wives. We pray for those among us who are sick. There is, of course, COVID, but there's the usual illnesses when the weather's been a bit nicer and we go out and about. There's chronic pains that might never again leave us in these bodies. There's besetting ailments that, Father, some of us return to almost like clockwork. And we're in so many ways, Father, not what we wish we were. But that's not the final word about us. We believe that. Help our unbelief. We recognize that in so many ways, Father, the days are very long, and they're also very short at the same time, and the years are very long and very short. We consider upcoming birthdays for Harriet Van Voorst and Brownie Faber. We thank you for these two women and the measure of health they enjoy. Grant them relief in their struggles, patience in, in what seems to go against them, thankfulness in what seems to go well, and bless them 
keep them in this year ahead. We think of other events that will mark this week that remind us that this life is a gift from you and that the goodness we see in this life is a gift from you. Some of us close our eyes too easily to what's wrong, but Father, others of us close our eyes to, to what's right. Help each of us, and Father, use times of rejoicing to, to draw us out of ourselves. Rejoicing with those who rejoice is a, a commandment to keep and teach us to keep it. Teach us the joys of, of walking in all your ways that way we would be happy in Jesus. And Father, teach us to give ourselves fully over to you. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. We're going to continue our study in marriage. Um, we're starting looking at marriage today. You've probably noticed that I've been using different songs, different pop rock songs as the introductions. And you might be thinking, okay, well, I don't know any of those songs. And... I guess I, 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 I can only say the songs that, that I know, and the reason I'm choosing these songs is because this is who sings about love and marriage and, and all these issues in our culture is the singers. So I'm sorry if these aren't songs that you happen to know. If, if I were you, I would certainly choose songs that, that you know well. So if, if I'm not in your genre, I, I apologize, but I do ask that you, you bear with me. Let's please, we're going to stand together. Let's stand. And let's open our Bibles to Ephesians, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. We're going to be studying this for the next three weeks, and we're actually going to be working backward through it. There's three sections, so we'll study the third section. And the second, and then the first, it's on page 1823 in the Bible I've got here. And I'm going to be looking at starting with verse 31. This is a quotation from Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. I encourage you to keep God's word open before you, especially if you just got engaged. You keep God's word open before you. <laughs> Let's go together to our God. And Father, we thank and we do praise you for your, your kindness is to us. We ask that you give us all that we stand in need of, Father, to give ourselves over to, to you, Father, your plans for us, because they are better than our own particular plans. And Father, we ask that you would lead and guide us as we hear your word. Father, be with me as I speak it. I ask that you would give me all that I do stand in need of to present this to, to your dear people. And Father, that they might see your son, who as we're going to see that this is about in ways that are surprising and delightful. So we can know Jesus better by, by what we study here. We ask this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, what is marriage designed to be? Rod Stewart sang this song to his wife, it was then Rachel Hunter, back in 1993. He turned it into a huge hit. Have I told you lately that I love you? This is a song he started crying about during, during MTV Unplugged. Have I told you that there's nobody else above you? You fill my heart with gladness and you take away all my sadness. You ease my troubles, and that's what you do. So is that, is that an apt description of marriage? Fill my heart with gladness, take away all my sadness, ease my troubles, that's what you do. Maybe you're a country music fan. John Michael Montgomery had a big hit that same year, 1993, about marriage. Maybe you think, okay, this, this is a better description. I'll give you everything I can. I'll build your dreams with these two hands. We'll hang some memories on the wall. And when there's silver in your hair, you won't have to ask if I still care, because as time turns the page, my love won't change at all. 
what's marriage designed to, to be? Now, if, if you don't have a good description of what you think marriage is designed to be, a metric by which you measure marriage, you're still going to measure marriage. It's just not going to be with a helpful metric. You're going to measure by your emotions. Okay, how, how, are we, how am I feeling about, about this? You're going to think about your expectations. What did I expect going into marriage? Is, is this person meeting my expectations? You're going to use some metric. You're going to use the, the metric of statistics. Well, 73% of couples say that they, they grow closer when they... You're going to use the, the argument of, of all these different ways that people tend to think about marriage. You might just use the last song that you heard on the, the radio and say, is, is our marriage like this? Does my husband love me the way that the Rod Stewart loved Rachel Hunter? And if so, what do I do then? Because Rod Stewart's bawling his eyes out, and then a couple years later, they're, they're splitting. We've all got metrics by which we judge marriage. And this morning, we're going to see, okay, what's Paul's metric? What would he say, okay, when you think about marriage, how do you think about marriage, Paul? Tell me. And what he'd say is, well, you think about marriage as a reflection of Christ and the church. And we're going to see over the next three weeks, this, this is incredibly practical. It's not just a, an answer that just seems hyper-spiritual but doesn't really mean anything, that you'd say, like, I, I should just say it and, and it's right, but what do I do with it? No, Paul says, here's exactly what you do with it. So we've got three weeks to think about this, and that's the claim of the sermon is marriage. It's a reflection of Christ and uh, the church, these two coming together. We're going to study this in three points. First, grounding the argument. We're going to see that Paul's making uh, an argument here that all the apostles are making arguments in their letters. And second, mystery in marriage. And third, an overview of responsibilities. We're just going to point our nose in the direction of, well, what do husbands do? What do wives do? If you've got your Bible open before you, I want you to see that what I'm saying comes from, from God's Word. These aren't my own thoughts. Verse 31, you get God's Word in God's Word. Because this is Genesis, Paul looking back to Genesis. 32 is our second point. This is the, the mystery made public. And third, finally 33, we're just going to kind of point our nose in the direction of, okay, husbands, what does this mean for husbands? Wives, what does this mean for, for you? Well, first, grounding the, ar the argument. We're going to be working our way backward through this passage as you got it here. We're going to be first, you see this first section, 31 to 33. We're going to study that this week. Next week, we work our way to husbands. What, what are husbands supposed to be doing in marriage? How do they behave in marriage? Finally, wives. How, how are wives supposed to behave in marriage? And the reason we're working backward is because I want you to see that Paul is arguing from something. He's making points about marriage from something. He's not simply thinking about his own experience of saying, well, you know, my parents' marriage, here's what kind of worked for them. He's grounding it in Scripture. He's saying, well, this is what God said in Genesis. And now we, we, we need to reason more that way because we tend to reason in, in every other way. I'm this way. Emotions, I reason by emotions a lot. If something just, just feels or makes me sad, well, it must be wrong. If it makes me angry, it must be wrong. But that, that emotions and reason, they often don't have anything to do with each other. And Paul doesn't reason by, by statistics here. He also doesn't reason by the surrounding culture. Well, everybody knows that marriage, he doesn't reason that way. He doesn't reason by human authority. He doesn't say, well, you know, Aristotle said this about marriage. He reasons by Genesis. He says, okay, this is what God had to say. This is what God did. For this reason, Genesis 2, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Now Paul uses the, the Septuagint here, which is the Greek translation. And I think the reason he does it, and he doesn't use the Hebrew, is the Hebrew says they will become one flesh. And the, the Septuagint says two will become one flesh. And you're going to see how important this idea of two becoming one is because it's all over this passage. And we're going to see that marriage, it's just a public picture of what God's doing in history of bringing things that have been separated back together. 
So I'm using the language here of Paul making an argument because we often don't think that way. I mean, I, I don't think I ever really had a view until I went to seminary and thought, okay, well, how did we get this book? I mean, I knew it didn't just kind of fall out of the sky. I knew that. But I kind of had the idea that maybe Paul would just kind of go into a trance and he'd wake up and, well, there, there's Ephesians. Or Peter's kind of feeling something weird inside of himself. He goes, oh, grabs a pen. Oh, oh, here comes First Peter. And then he kind of writes it. That, that's good. But no, what he's doing is he's making a, an argument. He's reasoning it out. God's word, it's fully God's word, but it's also fully Paul's word. It's also fully Peter's word. It's also fully John's word. They're reasoning their way through things. So it doesn't come outside of reason. What the apostles do is they, they look back at the Old Testament and then they look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and they say, okay, and for real life circumstances in which we're living, what, what does all of that mean for this? What does that, all this mean for marriage, which, which we're studying now? And they did this because they thought the churches were important enough for them to, to spend their time doing that. That's why pastors take calls to churches. Just because God's people are, are important enough to do the hard work of, of having a, a pastor reason their way through scriptures to say, well, what does God have to say for what you're in right now? So we'll, we'll reason through it. If you got your Bible, Ephesians 5, what I want you to see first in this Genesis passage, because again, you're, you're here, we're, we're pretending we're, we're sitting with Paul, and Paul's looking at Genesis, and we're saying, okay, Paul, what, what, what do you see? I, I, why, why, would you, why would you put this verse here? First is I want you to notice the, the body flesh language in, in verse 31. They'll become one flesh. And then look your way up the rest of the passage in verse 23. You see more of this body-flesh language. Verse 23, the husband's the head of the wife. This is body language. It's, it's one body, but it, it's, it's one flesh. They're, they're, they're connected. They are one. Or verse 28, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Verse 29, nobody ever hated their body, but they feed their body. They take care of their body. Paul's going to say, okay, why should husbands and wives act like a team? Why should you act like you're one, that what you do impacts your wife, and what the wife does impacts the husband? Because that's what Genesis says. This is how marriage was made to be. You two are, are one. And then you, you see the pursuing language in Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The idea here is that the husband's going out to, to the wife. He's pursuing her. And you see the same sort of proactive language throughout the passage. You see nourishing. You see cherishing. In verse 29, the man is to be going out of himself to do that. Because left to ourselves, as we saw in Genesis 3, we, we want to be safe inside of ourselves. Adam's there with Eve the whole time, but Eve's the one talking because Adam isn't ready to kind of step out. And that, that's a male tendency. And God calls us out of that. And that's because that's what Genesis says. And the wife, she's described in, in receptive terms. She, she's receiving her husband. They're united. The man goes to her, she receives him. And verse 22, this is what's going on. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband as to the Lord as the church submits to Christ. Verse 24, so wives should submit to their husbands. But we're going to be seeing that when we study this in wives in two weeks, the idea is, okay, you're receiving your husband's leadership. Bethany and I got to be involved with uh, the marriage conference this last weekend. We had ballroom dancing, and the idea there is the, the husband leads, the wife follows, and if not, everybody's toes get stepped on. And so we're going to see, well, how do you fulfill these roles? Now, as we, as we move toward these roles, I want you to think about, okay, well, why did the two become one in the first place? And if you have your Bible open, verse 31, that's what's going on with those first three words for this reason. We, we tend to jump over those. We're just, okay, well, for this reason, we just kind of gloss over those. But for what reason? Why would a husband and wife become one? What is the rationale for that? Well, whenever you see for this reason, what would make sense to do? 
if you came into an argument, I mean, a, a discussion that was going on a, after church and people were talking and someone said, for this reason, and then some, said something really profound, you would want to know, well, for what reason, right? Well, what did I miss? Well, what we missed was, was what comes right before this, which is Paul, I mean, sorry, it was Adam saying about his wife, she'll be called woman because she came out of man. So they were one, and then they were separated when God made woman. And so Paul says, well, for this reason, the two that were one should return to being one. There is a sense of completion in this, just as last week we saw with singleness, there's a sense of completion with being with, with, with Christ. So now all that we've done so far is just to, to sit with Paul and say, okay, how do you read Genesis? Why would you bring this up here? And we're seeing that what he says about marriage is simply because that's the way it, it, God created it to be. It's not just for, for his day. It's not saying this works really well for the first century, but don't, don't give this a shot in the 21st century. It's not going to fly there. Or, well, you know, well, people have, have changed in so many different profound ways that, that human nature is totally different. No, God's saying this is how, this is how I made it to go. And so what, what we got to do is make it our business, just like Paul to think in terms of, of Scripture. That the, that's what Paul's doing. The, the tendency that, that we have, that, that I have, is to take what I already think and kind of cram it into Scripture. That, that's, a, that's my tendency. That, that's that's the, na the natural human tendency, is to say, okay, how can I get God to agree with me? But Paul, he's, he's different. What we see here is saying, okay, no, God said this. How do I think through this in the way that I agree with God? If one of us is wrong, Paul would say, I want it to be me so I can change. This is what he talks about with how, how, do you, how, do you, how are you transformed by the renewing of your mind, by saying, okay, this book starts to set the agenda for how I think about things, for my marriage, how I think about well, what, what, what churches, how I think about how I, I deal with kids, how I think about with people that I find difficult to deal with, how you do all of this. And this is Jesus, he thought the same way. Th this is why he said, okay, when people are disagreeing with him, when Jesus says, okay, well, remember the scriptures. Or when he puts the spirit with the disciples, he says, okay, he opens their mind to understand the, the scriptures. It's not because he says, okay, now I'm going to make you super spiritual. It's to say, I want you to understand life because you're in God's world and you understand it by God's word. And if you don't understand God's world by God's word, you're going to have a really rough time in God's world. And God doesn't want his people to have that rough time. So he says, let me, under, help, me under, let me help you understand where you live and what life's about. So as we think about coming to see life in terms of God's world, we notice here a really beautiful picture of it in our second point, which is mystery made public. At first glance, Paul's words in verse 32, they seem to come out of nowhere, right? You're reading along, you're reading all about husbands and wives. Okay, wives should do this, husbands should do that. And then Paul says, ah, this is a profound mystery, and I'm talking about Christ and the church. I mean, when, I, when that first hits me, and that's what it does, is it hits me, it's like, what the world? No, no, Paul, you're talking about husbands, man. You're talking about wives. So you don't need to make things super spiritual, Paul, all right? We're just talking about husbands and wives. We can talk about Christ and the church later. But then you, you, you work your way backward, and you see he's really actually been talking about Christ and the church the whole time. You look, look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then it's a description of Christ and the church. Or verse 29. No one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and care for it just as Christ does for the church because we're members of his body. So he keeps going back and forth between Christ and the church and saying, okay, husbands, watch what Jesus does for the church. He takes care of the church as, as if it's actually him. Well, what, is, what does Jesus say to Paul when, he sees, when Paul's persecuting the church? Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? These, I'm one with these people. Just like when somebody offends your wife, well, okay, why are you offending me? You two are one. So Paul's been talking about both. 
And some people think that's what the mystery is. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And the idea behind this, um, Eugene Peterson, he translated that way in, in the message. The idea is that this is just too hard to understand, but it's really deep. But that, that's not how Paul uses the word mystery. We use mystery that way, right? We say, man, that's a huge mystery. We use mystery in the sense of, well, something we, we just don't understand, mystery novels. That's not how Paul uses the word mystery. And he uses this word a lot. In Ephesians, we're just going to look at a couple instances. But this is a regular word he uses in this letter. This is a letter about whatever this mystery is. Ephesians 1 verse 9, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things. So remember that this unity of, of all things coming back together. Or chapter 3, Paul says this mystery is the gospel. The Gentiles, that they're heirs together with Israel, members of one body, sharing in the promises in Jesus. The idea is two things that were ripped apart are now one. Ethnic strife, people being divided by these different aspects, becoming one. People in God who are separated by sin, becoming one. That, that's, that's how Paul thinks about the term mystery, is saying this has always been God's hidden plan, but how he's going to bring things back to the way they should be. Because right, if you think life is not the way it should be, you're right. right? But people know that. Anybody who thinks that this life is the way it's supposed to go just isn't thinking it through. This is a messed up world. And things that should be together aren't. The ways things should go, they don't go. So how is it made right? That's what Paul says by mystery. He says it used to be hidden, now it's revealed. And it's revealed in Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings things back together. That's what Paul's talking about here. For this reason, the two will become one flesh. Paul's saying, okay, that's why he goes back to Genesis to say, okay, what about men and women? How do you bring them properly back together? What's a picture of that? What's a picture of two things that are very, very different coming together? Husbands, what is it? Men are from, from Mars. Was it women are from Venus. Men are from Mars. I mean, the sense of two things that are very different. How do you actually put them together in a way that's peaceful? And Paul says, this is a picture of what God's doing. So what this means is, if you're married, your marriage, it's a public statement about this is what God's been doing through all of history. And what we got going between us, it's just a little picture of it. Bringing two things that are separate together. So this is why husbands should look at Jesus and say, okay, well, what does Jesus do? Should I, I, I should do that because our marriage reflects that. I should pursue her. I, I should lay down my life for her. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. I, I, I should I get out of my comfort zone, out of myself, and pursue her. Am I not going to want to? Yeah, a lot of the time I'm not going to want to because I'm selfish and I've been hurt. But is saying, okay, well, what does God want me to do? God wants me to do that. And for wives, it's a sense of, okay, well, I receive him. I, I, I honor him. Well, what if, what if he's not, well, we'll get to that throughout the, the series too. Because, yeah, he, he's not Christ. And she's not the church. But what you got, you got your marriage, which is a picture of that. So that means that if you're married, what, what you're in, this is, it's a little picture of the gospel. You're living in a little picture of the gospel. As Peter O'Brien put it in his commentary on this verse, he said, a Christian marriage is to reveal the mystery of Christ loving his responsive church. Such a marriage bears living witness to the meaning of two becoming one. So what this means is, think about the gems who are up here. All right, what that means is, thinking about the different marriages they see in this church and in their, their extended family, that's what's going to give them the pattern to say, okay, what does loving leadership look like? Well, I, you hope then it looks like the, the father seeking to, to love his wife well and apologizing when he doesn't. That's going to make it easier for that girl to say, okay, well, I, I want that. I, I want that with Jesus. 
It's the idea is you're making a picture of saying you're giving, giving people categories to understand or thinking about neighbors who don't know God at all. The, the reason that people often come to faith through personal connections is they watch you. And that gives them categories in their mind to say, okay, that, that's actually what reconciliation looks like. That's what forgiveness looks like. That's what actually two trying to become one looks like. I, I want that. Marriage matters, uh, matters a whole lot more than we think. Just like last week we saw singleness matters a whole lot more than we think. We so easily think in terms of the culture and how can we kind of, I mean, I do this, I so easily think in terms of the culture, how can I kind of have generally what everybody knows about singleness or marriage but with a slightly Christian twist. But God says, no, no, I, all of you is what I want. I want all of you for all of me. That's, that's the trade. And it matters so much more than we think because it's not, just about two people, it's actually, we're going to see, it's about all things. This is why, how does the new creation, when it's described in Revelation, what does it start with? It starts with a marriage, right? That's what it does. It's God's people coming down out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Who's the husband? Christ. Who's the bride? Us. And when that comes, the new creation comes. Everything's as it should be. This is, this is the return to Eden. The return to Eden comes by way of, of a marriage. And the best picture of this that, that I've seen, it, it might, might surprise some of us, it's, it's the Lion King. Posted that on Facebook this week, and I now know I've got everybody's attention between a certain age and a certain age, probably between 3 and 41. Lion King has a very strong pull. Um, but it's the, it's the scene where, where Simba and Nala, these are the, the, the two, they were cubs in the little, and then they grow up, and then they're, they fall in love as lions. Um, and they're playing with each other in, in, the, in the creation. They realize their love for each other, and this is the, the lyric. Can you feel the love tonight? The peace the evening brings. And here, here's the line. The world for once, in perfect harmony with all its living things. You can find some New Age elements in that movie, but the idea of the entire creation finding its perfect harmony in the idea of a groom and a bride coming together, that's just straight up Scripture. And you're the bride. And Christ is the groom. And that all things should be as they should be. Now this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and His people. So now, how do you put this into action? If you get a sense of, man, that, that's really glorious, and I'm married, how, how, do I, how do I be a part of that? That's the next two weeks, but this is just kind of pointing our nose in that direction. An overview of responsibilities. Doesn't even the slide look like the Lion King picture? Doesn't it kind of look, maybe I'm kind of going too far with that one, but I think it kind of does. So well done. Sharon, did you do this one? Well done on that one. Sharon very faintly waved on that one. Um, all right, so you put this glorious picture. I didn't tell Sharon about the Lion King before. I kept, I keep, I'm very under wraps. Um, you put this into practice in your marriage and in very, very practical ways. Often, I mean, I'm this way. I imagine you're this way. When I see something glorious, I get a sense of, I need to do something glorious to put that into action. But no, it's actually really mundane and normal stuff. Verse 33 However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, this, this is the next two weeks in short. So you paint this picture of Christ in this church with thousands upon thousands of tiny little brushstrokes of love and respect. But this, the husband, he sacrifices time to be with his wife that he would normally use for a hobby. That, that's what it looks like. just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He steps out of his comfort zone to bless her. For this reason, a man will leave his, his father and mother and be united with his wife. He starts to think about, okay, well, what would be life-giving for her? Just so he thinks about, okay, what would be life-giving for my schedule? Okay, well, what would be life-giving for her schedule? For nobody ever hated his own body, but they, they cared for it, just as Christ does for the church. So if you're a husband, you start to think, okay, how does 
God care for me? How does Jesus care for me? I want to do that for her. I want to be that for her. And when you see things in your heart that keep you from that, man, it's a sense of saying, okay, I need to put that to death. I need to step out of myself for her. Okay, well, what if she did this or that? Well, okay, well, we'll get to that, but that, that's not the main thing. The main thing is what does God call you to do? I mean, she, she doesn't have to earn the right for you to treat her as God commands you to treat her. Can, and she often shouldn't have to ask for it because God tells you to do it. And the wife, she starts to, starts to think about her husband and honoring her husband, even with his imperfections, to say, okay, well, because I want to honor somebody who is perfect. That's the first line, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And she, che she cheers on her marriage, even when, when it uh, looks like it's just a losing team. A man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they're, they're, they're one. She honors him, not because he's all, all that great shakes, but she honors him because he's hers. Now, this is for every husband, every wife. The, the, the word here for husband and wife, it's, it's in the singular, meaning he's talking specifically to all the husbands and wives in, in Ephesus, in that church. He's, this isn't for a hypothetical marriage. This is, this is for your marriage if you're married. And that's where obedience, I find for myself, is hard. I do, I'm a, I, I do a wonderful job obeying in Calvin's day because I actually don't have to do anything. I can just say, oh, I would do this. No, I would be with Calvin and Luther and man. I, but obeying in my own day, that's really hard because it actually calls me to, to do something. And this is what the, the next two studies are about is how do you do that? So this is about how, how do you put into practice, if you're married, in your marriage, what God's doing in history? I mean, this is about what God's doing with humanity, which means that in a way, have I told you lately that I love you? It's about what God's doing with us. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you that there's nobody else above you? You fill my heart with gladness. You take away all my sadness. You ease my troubles. That's what you do. Yeah, Rod Stewart, he turned that into a big hit, singing about his wife. But Van Morrison wrote it and sang it first. And he's, it seems from everything I can pick up from interviews, he wrote it about God. He wrote this, these lyrics about God. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's nobody else above you? You fill my heart with gladness. You take away all my sadness. You ease my troubles. That's what you do. There's a love that's divine. That's all right. For the morning sun and all its glory, Fills the day with hope and comfort too. You fill my life with laughter. You take the pain away and somehow you make it better. And you ease my troubles. That's what you do. There's a love that's divine. It's yours and it's mine. Like the sun. At the end of the day, we should give thanks and pray to the one. This is a song about the one who's willing to become one with his people. With you. I mean, think about this. Think about Jesus delighting to see you coming the way a bride, so the way a groom delights to see the bride coming. I mean, that, that's the best moment of the wedding ceremony as the pastor is you're here by the groom and they're super excited to see her come down the aisle. They can't wait for her to be there. I mean, sometimes they even kind of run halfway to kind of grab her because they're that excited. And that's a picture of of God and you. Paul says, this is a profound mystery. This is what God's doing. And I'm talking about God and I'm talking about you. And let's go to him in prayer. And Father, we thank and praise you for your love for us, more profound than we can understand. A mystery that's been revealed. And Father, we're here because it's been revealed. And we thank and praise you for revealing it to us, showing us how loved we are. Father, we ask that by your spirit you give us what we need to love you in return each day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to praise God together, singing God so loved.
The apostle who wrote those words said what eternal life is. It's to, to know him. It's to know God, to be one with, with him. Um, I'm going to be giving the, the benediction after which we'll be singing together the final song, which is I Stand Amazed. Um, encourage you to stick around, get to know each other if you feel comfortable with that. Also, reminder, we got a pork loin supper. It's March 31, stewardship and service chance. Different options there to depend how you feel comfortable getting the food, but get to know each other. But go with this blessing. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times. And in every way, may the Lord be with all of you. Amen.